but a large proportion. Um, it is said that 7% of the global uh, health budget around the world, which is approximately $500 billion, is lost to corruption. So the question we are asking is, okay, if, if corruption is so uh, rampant and, and, and is proven to exist in the health system in general, what happens with the health services that are meant to serve some of the most vulnerable groups, uh, which are the people affected by drug use disorders? Uh, what is the structure of health system and how are treatment tailored for the specific needs of people with drug use disorders? Finance, how are they planned? How are they coordinated? How are they provided? By whom? What are the mechanisms that are put in place in countries to decide what is the budget that needs to be devoted to this population? So with all these questions in mind, we started searching and of course we started finding information about what happens in terms of the use of resources and definitely there seems to be uh, corruption or at least lack of transparency and lack of integrity in the management of some uh, treatment services around the world. So I'm going to use this presentation, which I hope you all can do, just to, to help me structure the sequence of what I want to tell you. But basically, what is corruption? Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the work of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, we are the guardians of three important international conventions. The Drug Control Convention, yeah, the, that is the one, the, 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 the main legal framework for the drug control system. The Organized Crime Convention, the, the TOC, that deals with all the issues related to transnational organized crime, and it has two protocols dealing with the smuggling of migrants and trafficking in persons. And the third important legal instrument that we are guardians and we, our mandate is to support member states in implementing the recommendations of these conventions or the provisions of these conventions is the Anti-Corruption Convention or the UNCAC. So I mentioned this because the answer to the question, what is corruption, it's that there is not a clear universal definition. In fact, UNCAC, the convention per se, is not describing, is not providing a concept rather of corruption. Why? Because corruption can take multiple forms, can be expressed in many ways, depending on the country, on the region, on the culture. In fact, we may, we may know examples of acts of corruption that are considered normal or expected in many countries. And every sector in the life of a country, especially in the public sector, but also in the private sector, is literally vulnerable to corruption. So there is no definition, but what we know is that for corruption to occur, there have to be some conditions, yeah? So there has to be an authority and power there has to be an advantage given by that power and the abuse or misuse of that power in order to obtain a personal benefit. Yeah? So according to the UNCAC or the United Nations Corru Convention Against Corruption, this is the only legally binding instrument uh, regarding anti-corruption for all member states. It embodies innovative and globally accepted anti-corruption standards that are guiding countries in how to address this problem. It provides a comprehensive approach both to prevent corruption, assessing the risk of corruption, but also to enforce legislation yeah, so that those responsible for corruption can become uh, uh, in, um, processed by the, by the criminal justice system and offers a list of what are the universally agreed corruption offenses. So whilst there is no definition, the convention is giving us examples and agreed cases in which we can say that corruption exists. So the other thing that comes out of the convention is that corruption is a phenomenon that is constantly changing, evolving, and circumstances, like for example now, COVID, uh, are making the phenomenon even more evident 
and worrying and concerning because of the impact that corruption is having in the way the funds to tackle such a difficult program, problem are being, uh, are being used. So when it comes to corruption offenses, we have issues like active bribery. This is when there is use of the advantage of a position in order to act or refrain for act, uh, from acting. There is passive bribery when it's accepting an advantage uh, and from acting in matters relevant to some official duties from, from officials working in the government. Embezzlement, which is theft or diversion or misappropriation of, of, funding, of funds or goods uh, for personal value. The abuse of functions, you know, when a person goes beyond their own functions or fails to perform expected actions in violation of the law. Yeah. Then we have illicit enrichment when a person uses the fundings that are entrusted to them to, 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 to work on a specific area and they take it for their own personal gain. Money laundering, yeah, with this, the use of funding coming from usually illicit activities and convert them into legal money by means of putting this uh, money into legal activities. Concealment, which is hiding or retention of property, knowing that this is the result or has been obtained through corruption activities. And nepotism, which is the, the use of authority or abuse of that authority to favor certain people, be it family, friends, uh, known people, uh, uh, based on the, and those relationships make them obtain benefits. Elizabeth, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt. Is your, um, should your slide deck be moving forward? Because on my screen it's not. Oh, yes, in mine is moving. Okay, what's, um, where would we be at this point? It could be to the participants, I'm not sure, but I want to make sure. I am in the, in the, no, I am in the seven, eight. Okay. And we so, can make this available to participants afterwards as well. Do you so. want to move them? Or, I will. Or? Yes, you just tell me when to move it along. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, I also wonder if you can listen properly um, because of the settings that I have in my, my microphone should be working, but I'm still hearing. Yeah, it's supposed to be working. So you can hear me properly, yeah? Uh, yes, the, the audio perfect. is perfect. Yep. Okay, so please, the next. So when we talk about corruption in the health sector, next. Okay, corruption in the health sector can be a serious threat to public health and can even be an issue of life and death. And where we are seeing it now as we speak with the way the funding in many countries, the funding for COVID is being used for the vaccines, for the medication, for the medical supplies. We just need to think a little bit what happened at the beginning of the pandemic with some of the, we heard about the mask, the substandards of the mark, uh, mask or the equipment, etc. Yeah. So it can be, it can really put the life of people at threat. So the challenges is that corruption usually happens covertly and it's very hard to prove in the health sector. Um, in order to prove legal responsibility that a person has been involved in, in, in corruption, we need to have a proof of intent that the person really intended to take the money or the money or benefit themselves um, or, or their acquaintances as a result of their actions. And we know that COVID has accelerated the risk of corruption. And we hear cases from around the world, and in particular, some regions have been hardly hit because of because of corruption related to the management of funds for, for COVID. So I think this I mentioned earlier, that 7%, it is estimated that 7% or, or more that the 500 billion global health budget uh, is lost to corruption. Next. The next. Okay. So why has COVID been so dramatic in, uh, in, in, 
accelerating or increasing corruption around the world. First of all, because there has been large amounts of money like we didn't see before moving around across countries and inside countries to to acquire medical supplies, equipment, medications, etc., to address the pandemic. Second, because of the urgency, everybody had to move very quickly, so very little chance for countries to put in place or enforce whatever mechanisms they had to enforce uh, anti-corruption measures. Uh, the risk of undue influence on policies, uh, because policies are in place or policies were not put in place in regards to COVID and the management, so countries were just buying here and there without following a clear national legal framework to address the pandemic and because in most countries there are not enough anti-corruption mechanisms in place. So imagine in, in the emergency circumstances created by COVID that it of course was all worsened. So corruption definitely reduced uh, significantly the capacity of countries to respond to the threat of COVID because lots of funds were lost. Please, the next. Okay, so uh, incredibly, uh, we found this information that alarmingly, up to 45% of the global population, so when you ask anyone around the world, do you think the, the health sector is corrupt? 45% of the people around the world think that the health sector is corrupt or extremely corrupt. So imagine the reputation that the health sector has and the big responsibility of the health sector and that in reality, very little is happening to address this issue. Uh, next, please. Next. Okay, so why is what makes the health sector compared to other sectors uh, in, 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 in public planning and delivering of services, if we compare with education, if we compare with infrastructure, if we compare with other areas in the life of a country? First of all, because in the provision of health services, there are many stakeholders involved. There is public, there is private, there is transnational, there is international, there is a global market of, that produces uh, equipment, uh, supplies, and not all countries are producing medication, so there is many interrelationships both, both outside of the country but also inside of the country. Second, another important factor is the health system per se. Remember that there are different uh, uh, systems or different uh, structures of health system, both in the finance, in the planning and the provision with different combinations of public-private, private mandatory insurance, public insurance, national health system and so on and so forth. So because most health systems around the world are fragmented, then the use of the funding that should go into the provision of services can sometimes not be not so transparent. So if there is no transparency and there is no integrity, guess what? There is corruption, there is misuse of funds. Uh, this one I mentioned, the globalized supply chain, uh, chain of drugs and medical devices. The fact that the health sector manages sensitive information that can be used to manipulate that can be kept, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, to, to, to um, empower or assert influence. Um, information asymmetry, usually the producers or manufacturers may not declare all information about some of the products and the same the countries may not uh, disclose all the information about their epidemiological data, etc. There is no standardization of services there is usually a lot of money involved. Imagine the, the budget of a whole country on health, and there is a lot of uncertainty because even though countries should have good systems of data collection, epidemiology monitoring, and have good predictors of what would be the health behavior of their populations, and based on that, devote the necessary funds to keep the system functioning, this is not necessarily the case, and, and we will see why even in the drug treatment system, this situation is even worse, yeah? The next, please. So, the most vulnerable areas within the health sector are, of course, the, health, the service delivery and the financing, 
of the service delivery precisely because of the fragmentation, the large number of stakeholders, the different levels of care, the wide range of professionals that are involved in the provision of services, but also administrative and all sorts of personnel that needs to be involved in the provision of services and all the finances that go with that. And of course, the procurement and distribution. Again, most countries don't produce equipment, don't produce medical supplies they need to buy from outside. But then when countries buy, they also need to do this distribution internally. Yeah, so imagine all the different points or what we call decision-making points in the system from identifying the need for an equipment or a supply until that reaches out the point of provision, everything that can happen and how the lack of transparency and the lack of integrity of, on the side of those responsible, what the consequences can be. So it is estimated that globally 10 to 25% of all the money that is spent on procurement of medical equipment and supply is lost to corruption. So imagine how much more we could do if we properly tackle this problem. The next one, okay. What happened with drug treatment system? And here is where uh, me and the team, we have been looking at why is this different? Or what are the uh, specific characteristics of the drug treatment system that probably make it even more vulnerable? Because we know that in the treatment of drug use disorders, we don't need big imaging equipment, you know, like MRI equipment or computerized uh, tomography equipment or endoscopies and whatnot. But we, because of the nature of drug treatment system, we do require a lot of sectors to be involved and a lot of disciplines to be involved. And we need for good quality treatment of drug use disorders to happen, we need a lot of coordination with several uh, specialities within, within the health system and also at different levels of the health system. The next, please. So, the next. So, there are different drug treatment systems around the world. First of all, before going into this, something that I said at the beginning, Let's make reference again to the vulnerability. We are talking about a group of people, first of all, that are vulnerable per se. They may have a whole long life of disadvantages, uh, live in particular socioeconomic characteristics that keep them um, isolated or neglected when it comes to benefiting from public good. Uh, and then in addition to that are highly stigmatized, highly, um, um, uh, 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 yeah, stigmatized and usually feel, what I want to say now is that feel powerless when it comes to demanding the services that are required for them. And this is, uh, this is for the patients, but also for their families. There is this sense of not being entitled to when on the contrary, by being such a vulnerable population, they should be at the top of the priority of those responsible for providing. So a stigma and discrimination, yeah, and this is somehow the, what I always told my team, if we had a research question, it would be how much stigma and discrimination around drug use disorders and treatment of drug use disorders is contributing to the existence of corruption in the system because nobody cares, because this is a group that we don't, you know, is, is not integrated into, in the overall health system. Uh, what happens to them is not, you know, it's not really relevant. So how much that adds up to the vulnerability? On the other hand, I want to mention the World Drug Report uh, 2020 booklet five, because I think that corruption as it relates to drug use disorders goes beyond only the provision of services. Uh, in the World Drug Report 2020 Booklet 5, we show the association between certain socioeconomic characteristics and the, the, the contribution of those socioeconomic characteristics 
to the possibility of a person start using, starting using drugs, but also developing a drug use disorder. And those socioeconomic characteristics were mostly the level of education, the community in which a child is growing and developing, the, the presence of drugs in that community, the level of violence, but also internal to the household, household and the family, how much violence, how much neglect, how much abandonment, and of course, more intrinsic factors such as genetic, et cetera. But then all the combination of those socioeconomic factors with the presence of drugs can lead to drug initiation and eventually drug use disorders. But then the booklet five is also telling us how people who are uh, in that um, uh, condition of extreme vulnerability and, 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 and social isolation because of their drug use disorders, then are contributing or are kept in the low socioeconomic status or, 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 or strata, uh, if I may say. So it's a very vicious negative cycle, difficult to break. So what I'm trying to say here is that if in addition to the health sector, imagine how corruption is affecting, for example, the likelihood of a child having a good education, having access to, to quality education, or corruption impacting other areas of, of, of uh, education, health, uh, uh, infrastructure, housing, uh, the possibility of good jobs. So really corruption is so, the impact of corruption can be so negative, especially if we look at it also from the broader. But let us come back to the treatment of drug use disorders. So by looking in the literature, we found out that yes, there have been growing, uh, increasing number of reports pointing out at the existence of corruption, specifically in the drug treatment system. And even though some of these forms do not fit exactly into I told you there is no definition, be, but, but into what is the description of a corrupt act, like for example, insurance fraud. This is not corruption, this is fraud. But for fraud to occur, there has to be some form of corruption. Somebody is keeping their eyes blind, somebody is facilitating, and so on and so forth. So patient brokering, manipulation of data, and violation of privacy. Those reports we have found. The next, please. So. Before we move on, I want to remind us, because remember, when we talk about the general health system, the, the um, large number of stakeholders, the interrelation, the levels of care, the, all these factors contribute to corruption. So the, in this pyramid that comes from the International Standards of Treatment of Drug Use Disorders, we can see the different levels of complexity in the provision of treatment services. This is the should be. This is what the standards recommend. And as you can see, we have in the base of the pyramid, self-care, then we have informal community care. All of this is outside the health system, by the way. Then we have primary health care services where we consider the majority of the initial problems or more uh, less severe cases of substance use disorders can be treated, can be addressed at least. Then we go to the specialized at the top uh, at the pyramid um, that can be integrated into mental health services or outpatient services or specialized mental health services or drug treatment services within or outside the health, the health system. And then we have the long-term uh, residential or inpatient treatment services. And when you see the two bars at the size of the pyramid, you can see the cost, because in this pyramid we have at the top the, the highest, the, the most costly interventions, and at the bottom the, the, the cheapest intervention. And on the left, you have the frequency with which it is needed, meaning that the majority of patients or, or people who require some form of assistance because of a drug use problem can receive the care that they need at the lower, lower levels of the pyramid, which are the least expensive um, uh, interventions and reserve the, the more costly interventions for those patients that are more complicated, that have failed in treatment several times, et cetera. The next, next one. Okay, so keeping in mind that pyramid, we try to 
uh, think, okay, these types of corruption that we that we find in the literature, how do they happen in the drug treatment system? And then we found that basically it happens across the whole system, but of course, when you have systems uh, or services that require hospitalization, bedding, uh, a food, uh, lots of professionals. So the more resources that are required for a particular service, the more likely that any of those forms of corruption are expressed. The more uh, uh, personal, the more interaction uh, with community, with the family, etc., the more that issues like petty corruption, bribery, embezzlement can happen. So this is just to give us an idea of where in the system and what kind of or what types of corruption can happen. The next. So when we analyze drug treatment, we found that the following areas within the drug treatment system could be particularly vulnerable to corruption. One, when the government is planning, how do they plan? Do they have enough data? Do they have enough uh, epidemiological information that is telling them the size of the population affected, the kind of drugs that these people are using, whether there is injecting on or injecting, the, the, the needs of these people in terms of medication, in terms of staff to provide that medication. Do they have that so that good planning is happening? Oftentimes we know that this is not the case. Then whether the information is reliable or not, how is the allocation of resources and funding done? And then remember that in many countries, in, if not in most, with a few exceptions, treatment of drug use disorder is oftentimes delegated or is the provision is um, uh, is the responsibility of third parties that either independently or through agreements with the government, and we have several countries that have this, uh, this kind of, of, of system, are providing the services and in many cases also receiving funding from the government to provide these services, except for those that are purely private. So. In the cases where the money is allocated, how is the allocation of these funds? On the basis of what kind of information? To serve how many? With what kind of services? And so on. So these are, remember, we are trying to think of what are the vulnerable points where corruption can occur. So in the organizational management and administration, do governments know exactly, remember the pyramid? based on the affected population with drug use disorders, what type of services are required? How many patients can be solved through outpatient interventions? How many patients can, they be, can be served through uh, daily dispensing of methadone, for example, and, 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 and outpatient psychosocial support versus uh, long-term residential six, nine months programs that are deliver or are provided not necessarily on the basis of the needs of the population. I, I, I hope you go where I'm going. Then is there proper screening in the country to, to really assess? Um, is, is, is the screening done properly so that the need for services is real? The recruitment uh, of staff from the top level of decision makers to the lowest levels of service provi pro providers. Is there monitoring and evaluation? Is this of quality? Is this systematic? Is it based on scientific evidence? And very important, is there documentation? How is the information kept? And is there case management? Can the system know exactly what are the needs of each individual patient? Can we track that? And can we assess whether the money that was meant to treat even one particular patient, we know exactly where that money has gone. The next, please. Okay, so in drug treatment, you know, we have found that based on the descriptions in the, in the UNCAC, these kind of transparency violations, not to call them corruption, occur. The first one is patient enticement. Uh, by means of these, some centers are required to provide a number 
every month of patients that are seen so that they get their budget. So patients might receive some unethical incentives to enter treatment, to stay in treatment, or to move uh, from one treatment facility to the other. Listing hijacks is when unaffiliated individuals alter the contact details of the treatment facilities. They use means to do this, or they use the treatment facilities or phone centers to get information about the patient. When there is use of misleading language or misrepresentation of the services. So facilities denied affiliation with other facilities, for example, because of the reputation, or they not necessarily have the proper accreditation status, they have not been accredited or licensed by the government. The staff that is working in the treatment centers may not be accredited or licensed to provide the intervention. Um, when the insurance are accepted but do not really represent the interest of the patient or uh, wrong information is entered to claim the benefits of the insurance. Next, please. This is more fraud than corruption, by the way. The next, violation of private uh, information about patients. If centers are using the private information of the, of the patients for any reason, especially for campaigns or to even for political, we have been informed that in some patients this information is used even for political reasons. Overbilling the insurance, this is again, this is more than corruption per se, this is a case of fraud, but still, um, I guess those of you that are familiar with, the, with these reports from the uh, sober houses uh, task forces in the U.S. will hear a lot or will know a lot about what has happened in particular in some states like Florida and, and in, in California, but also in Massachusetts. I read the report and it, they found even uh, terrible cases of sexual abuse of patients. Bribery uh, and sexual favors, when patients are asked to provide sexual favors in exchange of, for example, a permission to leave the treatment center over the weekend or to skip one activity and so on and so forth. And sad as it sounds, all these cases have been documented and happened. And my question is, the next one please. The question is when I talk to, to, to the team is how much uh, is happening around the world that we don't know. How much of the terrible, because for me it has been sort of a even personal motivation when I travel around the world doing my job and you find all these terrible conditions in which patients with drug use disorders I kept and you wonder, is this because the money that should be devoted to treating these people and to providing humane uh, treatment, humane care, good conditions is going into somebody's pockets. I hope that's not the case, but it could be the case. And, and one thing that I want to say is that this work that we're trying to do here does not intend to point the finger, does not intend to do investigations about where corruption is happening. What we want is to understand, first of all, to know that the phenomenon exists, then to understand how this phenomenon is expressing in different contexts, in different countries, and what can we then do to support countries to address this problem and reduce the, the level of corruption so that the money that is intended to treat drug use disorders really uh, reaches those who are in need. We have been working for years uh, promoting evidence-based, training thousands of people around the world, uh, developing operational procedures, protocols, all sorts of interventions from policy, encouraging evaluation, data collection, uh, quality assurance. Yes, all that is fantastic that we have been doing that all these years. But what if, despite of all that, when the money doesn't get to where it needs to get so that services work properly, then all these efforts, I'm sorry, but all these efforts are wasted in, in some way. So what are the costs of corruption? Well, as I started at the beginning, it's a threat to public health and, 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 and the goals of public health in the population. And when we're talking about our groups, very vulnerable, remember that the, the drug use population in many countries is driving very important 
uh, uh, diseases such as hepatitis C that is very difficult to treat, very expensive to treat, HIV, hepatitis B, tuberculosis in some countries. So, and also because the fact that we're talking about a complex and chronic disorder. So if we don't provide the proper care uh, and the money is going somewhere else, then it, it threatens the public health goals of any countries. Of course, it hampers the citizens' right to access health services, which is a fundamental health right. Uh, it remains one of the main barriers in many countries because people don't have, there are not sufficient uh, of enough quality services for people, in particular people who are more vulnerable. It weakens the patient trust in the health sector. Um, it's very common, I come from a developing country, and it's very common that even people with limited resources, when they are sick, they they spend their limited money, and sometimes they have to sell a car or a house or whatever goods they have to go to the private sector because they don't trust the public sector, because they know that if they go to the public sector, they won't receive the care that they need. So if patients don't trust the institutions, specifically health institutions, imagine what it means for the for, for, for a citizen to feel so abandoned by, by, their, by the people that should be responsible for their care. So of course it decreases the effectiveness because if due to corruption we don't have the proper equipment, the proper medication, the proper facilities, the proper or the adequate staff that is qualified and with the skills to provide the interventions, then the outcome of any uh, interventions or services is not going to be the desired health outcome that we want to attain. Uh, it impacts the, the outcome of drug treatment in particular, and definitely it increases the healthcare cost. Because if we have 100 to treat 100 and 50 are gone elsewhere, it means that we have still uh, to treat 100, but with 50 instead of with the 100 that were meant to treat that people. Um, the next, please. So, on the other hand, if we address corruption in drug treatment, we are contributing to public health goals, we are contributing to improve human rights and access to the right to health by people, and beyond that, we are contributing to uh, reach the sustainable development goals, which is health for all, especially 3.5, uh, that includes prevention and treatment of drug use disorders. If we have enough resources, because those resources intended for treatment reach uh, the, the, the beneficiaries, then we increase the quality and accessibility. Remember that access to treatment service is, services is one of the main problems that we have. Only one in eight people in need have access to treatment services, according to the World Drug Report. We have better outcomes, of course, if people have the, the good medication, imagine opioid use disorders, if people can ha have access to methadone or buprenorphine or naltrexone or a combination or depot, I mean, there are several options for treatment that can only be offered to a patient if the resources to acquire are there. So the, 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 the better, the better uh, supplied uh, a system is, the more likely that the pos we will get positive outcomes. There will be better access to services without barriers. The patients will gain trust again in the health sector, and not necessarily only in the public, also in the private. But when people know that the money they pay, uh, either through their taxes or direct, is going straight to treat whatever is it that they need to be treated, allow governments to deliver their social contracts, because it is responsibility of the government to ensure, not necessarily only to provide, but to ensure that people receive the care that they need based on their health needs, and is highly cost effective, and should be in the interest of public budgeting. The next. The next, please. Okay, so what can be done? So one of the 
reasons why we agreed to do where we wanted to do this this activity is we we are in this process of awareness raising. Not many people, and some people have even said, "Ah, Elizabeth, why are you talking about this? This is not necessary." This no, we think it's important. Uh, again, not as an investigation, not to go after anybody, but at least to 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 make people think how much of what we see out there in terms of quality of services, availability of services, is because the funds are not reaching out to the people that should receive the services. So awareness raising, the users, the families, the communities at large, the governments, yeah, they are they are providing uh, funding to third parties. Are these third parties using those funds properly? Are they providing the services that are uh, needed? What can be done when UNODC has developed a specific tools to assess risk of corruption in the health sector, and we can use some of those tools to address and to assess the risk in the drug treatment system because the tool provides for that. So identifying the key decision points in the system will allow us to measure that risk and to mitigate the impact, to prevent corruption from happening and to uh, reduce the, or mitigate the effects of corruption. We can strengthen the participation of civil society when it's organized, when it's knowledgeable about what good quality treatment is, what based on evidence, uh, scientific evidence based on international standards. Governments can provide the population with lists for example, of certified treatment facilities based on international or on national standards. So when people are in need of, on treat, of treatment, they can identify what are those indicators of what is a good treatment uh, service uh, in terms of the interventions that are provided, the staff, uh, whether it's good management, good supervision, uh, respect for the rights of the patient, voluntary um, access or admission to the service. So there are several indicators of what is a good treatment facility uh, that uh, uh, if, if those responsible publish then can serve as a guide for the patient. Advocating and empowering patients um, uh, so that there is accountability. If a patient is well informed, then they can decide and they can assess whether the services they are receiving are uh, based on evidence or scientific evidence or standards or or, or the, the norms in the country. There is, it is very important that anyone working on corruption or doing investigation on corruption based, of course, on the national legislation is protected. So protecting journalists, protecting people who are putting into evidence or providing evidence that there might be lack of transparency or mismanagement of funding for drug use facilities, these people need to be protected because the least that we want is that we are uh, we have somebody that with good intentions is showing us a problem and then this person ends up being, uh, you know, whatever, bullied or, or even killed because of uh, denouncing. So protection of whistleblowers and witnesses and especially journalists is very important and this has to be granted in the anti-corruption legislation of any country. And of course, linked to that, it is important that countries have good legislation, good policies to address corruption, to have anti-corruption, and for that, going back to the beginning, we have the provisions of the UNCAC, the, the Convention Against Corruption, that all countries have signed, uh, member states of the United Nations, and that can guide the development of their own legislation. The next. So, for every dollar spent on everyday space treatment for drug use disorders, we save 12 US dollars of health and uh, negative health outcomes, uh, um, uh, less violence, less criminality, and et cetera. So let's make sure that every dollar that is intended to treat drug use disorders really makes it to the benefit of those that are in need. And I think with this, this is the last one, or please the next. Okay, so in summary, 
We have the UNCAC, and I invite those that are present or those that will listen to this presentation to look at the UNCAC, to read, to become aware that there is an international instrument that is legally binding and can support member states to develop their own national policies and legislation to prevent and to enforce measures against corruption. That Corruption, again, the fact that there is not even a, a, a definition for me says a lot because it's a phenomenon that is changing, that is evolving, that it shows in many ways in different countries, in different cultures. There, is, there are different levels of even acceptance of corruption as a normal thing to happen, and this should be unacceptable by all means. So. COVID, again, has facilitated corruption, is part of the, of the nature of the problem, and it's a risk that when people and when population are at the highest point of need of health care, then we see how the resources that should be intended to take care of the people are being wasted. And we've seen all sorts of issues around corruption related to the vaccine, from the production of the vaccine to the distribution of the vaccine. Entire countries, including high-income countries, where the first vaccinated were politicians and their families. All this is corruption, yeah? Because we've seen on the opposite, on the contrary, how the most vulnerable, including people with drug use disorders, have been left behind. There have been a higher mortality um, uh, due to COVID amongst our groups, amongst our populations, and this is unacceptable, especially if we think that probably some of the reason for that is that the resources were lost to somebody's pocket. The fact that corruption in the health sector is known to happen is rampant, is massive globally, yeah, um, that there is a high level um, of uh, perception amongst the population globally that, yes, there is corruption in the health sector, and this is very sad to be perceived as that, and, and the fact that the drug treatment system might be even more corrupt, I mean, we don't know, that's why this is a call for more research, this is a call for more awareness, this is a call for um, looking at this phenomenon with a view of with a view of what can be done to address it, what can we do to reduce it, to to make sure that the money intended to treat people with drug use disorders is used for that purpose. And then corruption in drug treatment, of course, has uh, very negative consequences and threatens public health and the goals, the health goals of, of countries. I think this is the very last. So with this, I finish, and then, of course, I'm open to your questions or comments about the presentation. And thank you very thank much, you so much. For the, for the invitation. Yes, I want to encourage any questions, whether people want to write in the chat or if they want to raise their hand. Um, really excellent. Thank you so much. We have about 10 minutes, so um, I'm going to start by asking, I think um, this goes really well based on what you were just, how you were finishing, but what measures do you feel can be taken to prevent the risk of corruption in the drug treatment system and to try to mitigate some of its effects? Yeah. Thank you, Carrie. Well, as I mentioned before, there is already a, a document or a guidance document uh, produced by UNODC to address corruption risks in the health sector. However, if we think of the tools that we already have available, I would say that first, the international standards of treatment of drug use disorders are an excellent guide for planners, for, for those who are uh, uh, preparing budgets, for, because the standards help them really understand what the system of treatment of drug use disorder should look like, what are the different components, what are the qualifications of the staff, the composition of the staff that is required for each of these settings and levels of care. But beyond that, I would say we have also quality assurance mechanisms that both at system and service level can be useful, especially because one of the key components of quality assurance is good governance. I think good governance is a crucial element to not only identify where could be those points in the system, in the planning, in the financing, in the provision of services that could be more vulnerable, but then also 
identify but also address. So quality assurance mechanisms, especially good governance, are, are particularly um, uh, important. Thank you. So we, you mentioned doing more research, and of course that's always key. That's another, yes, yeah. of course, because we have been searching everywhere. Um, you know, for example, uh, UNODC, as I said, is addressing corruption in the health system in general. There is a UN multi-agency or interagency, rather, task force to address corruption in the health sector. WHO is part of the task force, the World Bank, UNFPA, UNDP, and UNODC. And um, of course, there is a lot of research about corruption in the health sector in general, but when we look at the drug treatment system, there is very little. I think it's, again, part of the stigma and discrimination that there is in this sector. I think that what has happened lately, in, particularly in the U.S., uh, could be a good trigger for other countries. Um, because we do hear there is a lot of anecdotal information about, uh, you know, when it, I mean, corruption is saying, I do treat uh, drug use disorders, and then what you provide inside the center is not science-based. Right. You don't have that, 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 although there is not a definition, that is part of the, of the conditions by which corruption is somehow described or, 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 or yeah, identified. So, um, Yes, I think more research to understand the phenomenon, to really uh, know where it happens, how it happens, who are the people involved. And again, it's not that we're going, our goal is not to send people to jail or do a newspaper headline with we found this, this and that. No, that's not the purpose. The purpose is to have technical assistance tools like the quality assurance, like good governance uh, instruments to allow governments to ensure that the money that they are, uh, because usually, remember, in low and middle income countries, funds for health sector are limited. Yeah, uh, uh, the same for edu. Usually, public services, the budget are always limited. So within the health sector, our populations are already neglected. So if that money doesn't doesn't go to where it needs to go, then um, for me, it's really a, a tragedy. It's really a tragedy. So raising awareness, doing more research, understanding the phenomenon, and addressing it with good information, knowing what needs to be done. For example, in a, in a recent event, there was uh, somebody, there was this medical doctor saying, we need to start train, training the health professionals when they are being, you know, at the beginning of their careers, so that they know what is corruption. Because in some cultures, it's so embedded. Uh, it is expected, for example, that in certain countries you need to pay a nurse so that you can go and visit your family. Even though there is a hospital policy for visits, if right. you want to go out of those hours, you pay the nurse and then, yeah, you can visit your, your loved one. That is corruption, but it's accepted. People go pay, go, so how can we change that? Well, maybe we need to start training not only medical doctors, but nurses, uh, social work, everybody gets a notion, at least, of the phenomenon, how it happens, and they can become also factors of change because they can identify and they can become aware, oh, when I am accepting money, I'm not doing a favor to this family. I am, I am, being, I am involved in a, corrupt, in a corrupt act because many of them are not even aware, yeah? So, and we have a comment from one of the participants that says many programs are using COVID as an excuse to not provide services that are promised and science-based. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carol. I see that this question is definitely that is the case. We are seeing how uh, even for the purchase of some medications, you know, now there are all these very strange and very expensive medications that there is not yet a clear protocol for the treatment of COVID, yet a lot of money is being spent. I hear in Latin America and in my own country, lots of uh, medications, of people even taking that, them uh, on, on their own decision without a prescription. So all that is money. All that is health money that is being spent 
wrongly. Uh, so yes, I think COVID has been used as an excuse to to divert funding that maybe should be going to the most vulnerable people to mm -hmm. to address. Uh, I don't know. I, I I think that this is um this is an important uh, point to reflect on the situation we are today because as many people say, COVID will not be the last pandemic. So there are many studies now going on on sustainability, resilience of health, of health sectors, because that's another thing that we have seen. You know, health systems have not been prepared. Uh, the resilience of health systems has been put to, to a test by COVID in many ways. And uh, I think this is a time to step back and really reflect that unless everybody is served, nobody is served, because with COVID we have seen how it has affected everybody, irrespective of social, irrespective. And again, <laughs> then we need to go back to the corruption issue of how some people have benefited from, from right. yeah. Well, I want to um, thank you so much and thank our participants. I have just put my email address in the chat. So if there's anyone who would like, um, I know a few of the slides at the beginning, they weren't able to see Elizabeth. So can I share your PowerPoint? Yes, yes, you can share my PowerPoints. They are, I am really interested in, 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 you know, any of this information. It's all, um, is based on, um, I can share also that with you. This presentation was prepared based on a fact sheet that, uh, is referenced. So all the information that we're putting here ha has been referenced. There is research behind that or there are technical documents behind that. So I'll be happy yeah. to share the fact sheet with you as well. And I also want to send everyone to um, icuddr.org. And the top left, if you look at the um, drop down, you'll see the blogs. And Elizabeth has been kind enough and some of her colleagues to write a blog for us about this topic. So if you're interested, that's also another resource for everyone. Thank you. And with that, thank you so much My for pleasure. your time. Thank you from ICUDDR. And we hope to see everyone again soon. Yeah. Thank you, Carrie, and uh, yeah, an invitation to everybody to look at this also now with open eyes. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye. Mm-hmm.